So, the inspiration from this video was kind of spontaneous. I was modding my Xbox 360, and, you know, I was thinking about kind of my early days of gaming, and how I used to take my 360 everywhere with me, wherever I went, so I could always game on the go. And I had a lot of great memories, but, you know, I started to think, you know, back then, what if I had a portable computer that I could take with me instead of a 360? How different would things have been? Because I could have played a wider variety of games. Well, that's kind of what inspired me to make this video. Today, I want to show you for how cheap you can make a portable PC that you can use to play some games and it's going to be portable and you can carry it wherever you go if you want to travel and it's going to be cheap. About the same price as a used Xbox 360. When you want to go back and play some of the games of yesteryear, some of the games that made a lot of memories for you as a child, whether they be 360 games or emulated GameCube games or maybe some of those old school MMOs, I think that a computer like this is really going to do very well in that regard. So I encourage you to keep an open mind and stay tuned. I'm going to show you how to build a portable PC that can play the games that you enjoyed as a kid and it can do a lot more than an Xbox 360 for the exact same price. And I'm setting a budget for $50 because $50 is about how much you'll pay for a used Xbox 360. So, for 50 bucks, let's see what we got. Let's see what kind of computer we can build and what kind of gaming performance we can get out of it. Every artist has to start with a blank canvas. And for us, that is the Dell Optiplex 760. I picked this little girl up from a thrift store for 20 bucks, specifically, 1993. Not sure why, but um, I think it came out of a, it's, it's in fantastic condition. I think it actually came out of a church because um, if you look on the bottom, they put a sticky note with the password for Windows on it. It says, God is good. So, probably came out of a church, which by the way, that's a really good way to get your shit stolen. Don't put your password on the bottom of the computer with a sticky note, please. I mean, I know realistically, it's probably in an office. No one's gonna touch it, but still, it's just, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. But yeah, that's where we got this, um, this PC, 20 bucks at a thrift store. So that's a good start. Uh, in terms of specs, we have some sort of Core 2 Duo in Windows Vista. That puts this machine around the 2005 to 2007 mark. I would probably closer to 2007, I would say. That's really when the Core 2 Duo started picking up steam and becoming more popular. So, let's open it up and see what else we have inside. Very easy little mechanism up here. Push that back and it will release the spring-held side panel. Just falls off very quickly. A uh, very thin optical drive here that can read DVDs and CDs. Very small power supply here. Um, we can do a max of, I believe this is, uh, looks like 230. 230 watts. So, um, not a lot of power budget. Certainly not for, you know, a big, powerful, gaming-level graphics card, of course. Um, so, power envelope is going to be something that we're going to struggle with here. Now, right here is our CPU shroud, and uh, we actually have a... Oh, God. Well, that used to be a fan. Oh, that's awful. And that was designed, I guess, to cool the hard drive as well as the uh, chipset, because the chipset heatsink is underneath it. Oh, oh, that is, that is horrendous. That's giving me goosebumps. Oh, I hate that. So, um, our CPU is under here. We have a Core 2 Duo. I will be upgrading this today. Um, 
Now we're trying to compete with an Xbox 360. The Xbox 360 used a PowerPC architecture that was also a dual core. Well, dual core for PC gaming is, uh, we don't have that kind of optimization that the console had, so we have to get a little bit creative. So going up to a Core 2 Quad Q6600 classic CPU is going to allow us to have a little bit more uh, CPU to play with because we're going to we're still at uh, two cores but we have four threads. So that hyper threading is going to give us a little bit more performance in our games. So that's a good start. Also, we're going to have to upgrade our GPU. This computer actually was very surprised to see this. Uh, the thing actually shipped with a, a GPU. Let me see if I can I'm gonna get it out of here. I got the GPU out. We only have one PCI Express slot to work with. This thing is like on another level. I mean, it's really small form factor. Everything is packed in here. You actually, um, this tray here is meant for a hard drive. It came with a 320 gig hard drive, very small. Uh, but I took that out because we're gonna be putting an SSD in here, uh, of course. But we only have one uh, PCI Express slot to work with and you actually, you have to remove the hard drive tray in order to unlatch the PCI Express slot. So, that's a bit of a shame. It's just so tight, but it's okay because um, we got the components that are going to fit in here, so it's it's no problem. But uh, I was really curious what GPU this thing shipped with. Uh, it's this thing, and it's, it's cute. It's from uh, ATI. Uh, I actually um, was kind of curious as to what uh, GPU it was, it didn't explicitly say it on the back here. Um, it, it has a serial number, but it doesn't have a model number. But uh, I googled the serial number, and from what I could tell, this particular GPU looks to be an HD3450. Um, the precursor to the uh, the 5450, which is a notoriously bad GPU. But uh, this is more of just a, a graphics adapter rather than a gaming GPU. Just something for you to be able to have a display for your monitors and not necessarily to play games on. One thing that's pretty interesting about it though, check out its connectors. So you have S-Video on the left, that's serial video, one of the old uh, display connector standards. But on the, um, on the right here, this is a connector called DMS-59. Now this is actually a pretty neat connector. This was used during the time of uh, DVI and VGA, uh, when analog video was commonplace among uh, computers. Um, it's actually still used today in a lot of uh, industry, like plants and stuff, where you have to use that old technology and they don't want to update them because you can't risk downtime and lose a lot of money. So it's still used some places, but... Uh, it's, a, it's a remnant of that uh, analog video era. And the interesting thing about DMS-59 is that it's designed to break out into two connectors. So it's one port with two video connectors coming out of it. And you have to use a special adapter with it. Actually, I have one right here. Let me get it real quick. So this is an adapter for a DMS-59 connector. So this one, as you can see, it starts with a DMS-59 um, connector on this side, and then it breaks out into two VGA connectors. So you can see it's one um, port with two video connections coming out of it. And um, yeah, it's pretty in interesting. There are actually a couple of reasons why DMS-59 came along. Um, at first, when I first learned about it, I didn't really understand it. But as I, you know, kind of understood it a bit more, it made more sense. So back in the analog days, it's not like HDMI and DisplayPort. In terms of manufacturing, it would have been more simpler to have one connector on there and then just have the signal split out into two different ones rather than have two DVI or two VGA ports on one GPU. Also, for systems like this, it's a perfect use case. You see how this is only a half height PCI Express bracket? Well, you can't fit two DVI connectors on here or two VGA connectors. Mm, the VGA connector may, may eh, no, I think it's still too small. Anyway, you can't fit two 
display connectors on here. Um, so it makes sense to have one that when you use an adapter can actually break out into two. So being able to consolidate space and being able to make the most use out of what limited, you know, PCI Express uh, slot width that you have makes a lot of sense to me. So yeah, for very small form vector machines, uh, being able to have one connector that breaks out into two is nice, especially for something like this that was intended to be a business computer and in an office. You can have both of your monitors and run a dual monitor setup. I think that's great. So it uh, definitely makes sense as a nifty little connector. Uh, people will often, since these things are so cheap and the uh, adapters are very cheap too, you can probably get the GPU and the adapter for like $10. These are actually quite common in uh, servers um, because just as a very, very cheap way of getting a display signal. So that's pretty interesting. But uh, as, uh, as I alluded to earlier, this GPU is not really the best when it comes to gaming. So I think that that kind of segues into uh, the next portion of this video where I go over the components that we're going to be upgrading the system with. So let's take a look. Let's start with our graphics card. Now, I talked earlier about this power supply. The problem is this power supply is only 230 watts. It's simply not enough juice for us to expand it with any sort of competent graphics card, at least a high powered one. It, it, all of the connect, it doesn't have any extra connectors. It only has one SATA uh, power connector, which we can't adapt that off. We have to use that for our drive. Uh, it has one, that's either a 20 pin or an 18 pin power connector for the motherboard. Um, this little, I don't even know what this connector is called. It's not SATA, but it's some kind of power connector for the optical drive. And then you have CPU power. I'm pretty sure it's underneath the optical drive somewhere. You just don't have that much room for expansion here, which makes sense. I mean, it's very small. You got to keep it small. You got to keep the power budget low so that the thing doesn't cook itself. So it makes a lot of sense. So I had to really research and really dig deep. And thanks to a video by one of my favorite YouTubers, Green Ham Gaming, I was able to see an example of a Graphics card that doesn't consume a lot of power, but is still fairly performant for what it is. And that is where I'm very excited to introduce you to this little lady. This is the R7 250. Part of the uh, AMD uh, Radeon line from, I think, uh, 2013 or 2014. 2013, 2014, 2012, around that area. Um, the the big brother of this was the R9 290, uh, and then that would later be revised into the R9 390, which is actually my first ever GPU. This is part of the same Hawaii architecture. Hawaii was actually where they unveiled uh, this new lineup of GPUs. But this one is uh, not an R9 series, it's an R7 series, or I'm just gonna call it the 250 for the rest of the video. Um, <laughs> so it's not, uh, not as high up there as the um, as the uh, R9 290, but still, you know, for what it is, it's uh, a lower to mid-range GPU that's going to definitely be capable of playing some of the older titles that we want here. Certainly beats the crap out of the Xbox 360. Uh, the Xbox 360 actually used an ATI GPU from, I think it was like 2004, 2005. It was uh, a desktop, uh, or actually a mobile level GPU that was further cut down uh, to fit with the Xbox 360's um, power budget. Uh, but this does not have any such issues. This has one gigabyte of VRAM. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention, um, you, you can see it in between there. Uh, this system actually shipped with four gigs of uh, DDR2 RAM. Uh, I don't currently have any more to put in there. So that's going to have to work for now, but four gigs should allow us to play uh, some stuff. Um, so certainly some of the older titles that we wanna work with, uh, that's, that should be perfectly fine. But this GPU is definitely going to blow the 360 out of the water uh, in terms of the games that it can play. Um, so I'm very excited to see what this can do. I did see the video from Greenham Gaming where he kind of showed this thing off. And I gotta say, um, 
for how much this thing costs, this cost me $10. Uh, you can actually get quite a bit of performance out of this thing. I mean, look at the, this. The, it's actually quite kind of substantial. You can actually see it has a copper fin heat sink. Uh, and it's a tiny fan, but this thing should actually do a pretty good job of dissipating heat, which is good because it's going in this very, very cramped case. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to see the performance of this thing. The R, I'm pretty sure it's R7 250. Um, should be great. Very, very nice little pickup here for 10 bucks. Uh, to you know, breathe some new life into this old machine. Uh, I think that this is going to be a great addition. Uh, and then lastly, the kind of uh, the last uh, uh, component I really want to talk about. We have our GPU, four gigs of RAM, uh, and then here is our storage upgrade. So this is an Intel SSD. Uh, it's a 180 gig SSD. Um, so it's not huge, but it's going to hold Windows and a couple games for us. Um, I didn't have anything bigger and I didn't want to go buy anything bigger because prices aren't really where I want them to be right now. So uh, this is just what I had on hand, but you know, you can get a bigger SSD if you want to replicate this build. You can just buy yourself a bigger SSD, but this is definitely going to demonstrate the point of, you know, getting those fast loading times, booting up Windows fast. Um, it's just that I might have to only have a few games on it at a time, but that shouldn't be a problem. And uh, again, if you want to replicate this down the road, um, obviously the prices for some of these are going to be the same and you can just add a, be a better SSD if you want. But we have our uh, SATA power and our SATA data cable from when uh, we had the hard drive in here. So this is where the SSD is going to slot in perfectly. So that is all of the components for our upgrade. So I think we need to get it put together and then we will see what this thing can do in terms of gaming and how it stacks up with an Xbox 360. So with a $10 graphics card, $20 SSD, and a $20 uh, computer from a thrift, thrift shop, we are coming in at a total of $50 for our entire machine compared to $50 for our 360 here. So let's put it all together and let's see where your $50 is better spent in terms of how well it can game. And there you have it. We are, in fact, able to get some gaming done 
on a $50 computer. With an old Core 2 Quad Q6600 and an R7 250, we are able to achieve some gaming results that are capable of an Xbox 360. And unlike an Xbox 360, we even have access to games that aren't available on the Xbox. So, one of the advantages is we have access to a, a much larger uh, PC game library. Now, at the start of this video, I think a lot of you probably were thinking about all of the things that this computer cannot do. And I challenge you in the future, don't think that way. I challenge you in the future to think about what these kinds of computers can do. Instead of, you know, um, ridiculing this thing for not being able to play Crisis at 100 frames, uh, ultra settings, praise it for being able to run the games of yesteryear of the Xbox 360 era at playable frame rates and being a very nice, sleek, portable, compact package. There is still some value in going back, fixing these things up, and getting them ready to play some games, especially at such a low price. So, I'm very happy with how this turned out. I think this is a great little budget portable gaming box, and I look forward to playing more games on it in the future when I go travel or go visit my family. So, thank you guys for watching. Let me know what you think down below. What did you think of this project? you think it was successful? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you next time.